This episode is brought to you by Summer School Electronics. With pedals like the Snow Day Delay, the Pep Rally Fuzz, the Trash Panda, and my personal favorite, the Science Fair, which is two classic dirt pedals in one with a mid-boosted overdrive on one side, a black lab rat circuit on the other, and a blend knob to blend between them to find the perfect classic stacked dirt sound you're looking for, it's hard not to find something you'll love. Mark builds all of his pedals by hand in Syracuse, New York, where he also works as a full-time educator. In addition to the super fun graphics on their pedals, Mark also offers custom artwork. Want your dog's face on a pedal? He can do it. Want your face on a pedal? He can make that happen too. Go over to summerschoolelectronics.com and make sure to tell them that 40 Watt Podcast sent you. That's a jam. Ooh. And it started twice. Look at that. <laughs> I, I just pulled a get offset. what I just did. Just let it uh, roll on repeat. It actually would stop on its own, apparently, if I had just left it alone. But I was trying to stop it right at the end, and so I just started it again <laughs> instead. Look at that. It is kind of jammy. It's it's kind of up your alley, too. It's yeah. Like not, was, not like hard surfy, but well, it was like, like if, it was straddling between like surfy and bluesy, you know? Yeah, like like if a bunch of guys from New Orleans moved to California and started a surf band, mm. it'd be like Swamp Surf. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I, yeah. I I, totally, I I just had an image of like a bunch of guys in wetsuits surfing on crocodile backs, and like that's going to be a thing now for, in my head. Swamp Surf. What it sounds so, like is like any time there's like a like a movie or a TV show that's like, oh, we need like 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 a surf music part for this background and like. <laughs> Whatever musicians they have, like, well, we don't really do that, so we'll try our best, and they just throw a bunch of reverb on blues music. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I feel like at that moment, I feel like in that moment, like you got all these musicians. Hey, we need a surf backing. They just turn to the drummer to see if he knows Wipeout. Right, right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we haven't. We're we're straight into this. We haven't done any sort of introductions, or whatever. I know. I'm I mean, running your show for you now. No, uh, it's fine. So. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to 40 Watt Podcast. Today's episode, if you have not already figured out, you probably saw the name of the episode already. I'm sure I mentioned Ryan's name somewhere in it, maybe. Uh, So, my guest today is Ryan Burke. But before we get started, I will do my housekeeping. Y'all get so tired of hearing this, but you know what? I got to do this to pay the bills. So, if you will go to 40wattpodcast.com, you can find... A website where I put all the show notes. You can find links to all of the things, social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can find my Reverb affiliate link where if you click that link and buy something from Reverb, I get a little bit of a kickback and it helps the show happen. Um, or if you don't have a Reverb account, I get a kickback if you sign up. There you it go. It costs you nothing. Look That's that. the good, good kickback when people sign yeah. up and off your link. I think it's That's like it. it's like five bucks each time or something like that. That's the payout right there. I can't remember. Oh yeah, it's great. So everybody yeah. go make an account or several. Um, <laughs> make new accounts, guys. You know, <laughs> we all we all have like four or five emails at this point. I was, if, I was just about to say that we've all got multiple emails. If you're a middle aged person in 2021. You got your first email address. It probably has 13 in the name because that's how old you were when you signed up for the email address. That's what we all did in the late okay. 90s. Go uh, dig up that old Hotmail account and sign up for a new Reverb account off his link. You know, I was able to. So my first email account, I haven't even finished the intro here yet. My first email <laughs> account, um, I signed up for because so in my household, I was the one who signed us up for Internet. Like it wasn't my mom. It wasn't. It, it was me. Like called the Internet company, like had, had like set it up. Didn't even tell my mom. <laughs> Hey, mom, we have the internet now. Your mom picks up the phone and she hears like the sounds. She's like, yeah. what is going on? What is that? All right, that, that 28.8 baud mode yeah. I had. I, I was lucky enough. I got in late enough. I never had to deal with 14.4. Um, but um, so I signed it up. And so I had my very first uh, email address through my provider. Right. Mm. And so it was P Carter at the name of the provider. Um, super generic. I got back into that account. Like it still exists. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I have no idea how it got back in there. And it had like junk tied to like 
uh, like all sorts of like forums that I would oh be my on. Gosh. Like, oh no! Yeah. Oh, it was it was crazy. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was all junk, and I I really wanted to write the company and be like, please delete this. This is taking up space on your server that just does not have to happen. Future archaeologists are going to be hackers. Yep. They're they're going anthropologists. Digital archaeology. Did, yeah, digital digital anthrop anthropology digital ar archaeology they're going to be hackers that have to dig into like forgotten servers with forgotten emails and they're going to have to hack into them in nobody in, knows the password in anymore. creative ways and they'll get fragments of messages between some 17 year old and a 14 year old in you know 1998 and they'll be like this is yeah. where it all started the, yeah, they're 12 and, monkeys. And this is the doing... source of the 12 monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> and all of their communication is just like a slightly more advanced version of writing boobs on a calculator. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> oh my gosh. 600 years in the future. Oh my gosh. The dirty pictures that are going to be historical artifacts <laughs> oh that we used to send to each other as jokes to prank oh. each other. Oh, it's not going to be good. No, I, it's not a good future. We haven't set up a good future. No, we haven't. <laughs> but speaking of setting up a good future, you can set up a good future for this podcast by going to patreon.com. We're still in the podcast. intro. <laughs> yeah, I still haven't gotten there yet. Um, where if you go over to Patreon for as little as $3 a month, you can help support this podcast and make it happen. And maybe one day, if I ever have sponsors, hey, sponsors, hit me up, 40 watt podcast at gmail.com. Um, you you who support at the $3 level will get an ad-free version of this podcast. Right now, it's all ad-free, uh, except for my ad right here. Invest um, in the future. You want that ad-free when he starts getting the do. sponsors You're rolling in. You're going to want it. Yeah. Well, for $5 a month, you get an extra episode every week where I How talk do you do about that? all the... Huh? How do you, How do, you, you do that? Yeah. It's magic. <laughs> it's magic. You make magic. an extra episode. I make an extra episode every week. Wow, that's too much work. Oh, you didn't know you signed up for that. So Ryan's going to be on an ep extra episode with me after this one. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, a two-parter. So see, he didn't even know what he signed up for. So that's the trick. Don't tell your guest. Mm. Just do it. Now I've got to save the saucy uh, stuff for later. It, yeah, exactly. You, you can get really controversial behind the paywall. Ooh. So that's where you want that. All the fun stuff happens on the Patreon episode. I hope you're ready to talk about Israel. Oh, dude. I'm so ready. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's not a dude. I thought we were just talk talking about a dude named Israel. Like the country, the country. Gotcha. you know, like political stuff. You know. Oh man, <laughs> I love talking politics. I just got talking. I just got through talking to a buddy of mine in uh, British Columbia about Justin Trudeau. I got saucy stuff I want to talk about oh, Canadian boy. politics. I hear you're a big fan of Canada. Oh, I just love Canada. <laughs> So, so people thought that I hated Canada because I made a I, I made a silly joke and like two Canadians took it seriously and they were out for me like Ryan hates Canadians like they were going on forums and groups and like telling people this guy hates Canadians and I was like I said that as a joke because no one hates Canadians <laughs> there's like right. no reason to hate Canadians <laughs> I like sarcastically I said like ah oh, Canadians oh can't stand them right like Someone took it so personal. <laughs> like every Canadian I've known personally has been darling. Just wonderful people. Right. They're fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I did discover uh, an interesting t statistic today. So we're, we're, well, not today. I was talking about it again today. And mm. I learned it a couple of weeks ago. You just rediscovered so, it in your memory today. Just I now. did. I yeah. did. It like a digital archaeologist, oh but it was analog. So it was in my brain. Um, Are our brains seven, analog? I, I think so. Or mm, okay. analog. All right. So, um, 70% of Canadians live south mm -hmm. of the 98th parallel. So, yep. like, the entire state of Washington is north mm -hmm. of 90 of 70% of Canadians. They all live in that little pocket in between the Great Lakes that dips down yep. below, like, the northernmost border of the United States. So, it's like... Yeah, it's wild. Yeah, you think like, oh, they're Canadians. It's freezing cold up there. And yeah, it's cold, but most of them are living where a freaking ton of Americans are living. <laughs> yes. Like, that's New York, right? Like, they're to yeah, the side much. of New York. And Michigan and, and yeah. that whole area there. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So, 
Speaking of fascinating, I'm all about the transitions today. There we go. So, Ryan, thanks for coming on the podcast. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> hanging out and talking. Um, so a ton of my listeners and, and the couple dozen viewers are going to know who you are already. Mm. Um, cause w- there's a lot of crossover especially of since we did, we did an episode recently together right after Nam. So you yeah. were technically on that episode. It's a smallish um, scene. It's the smallest community. Like it really, re- everyone I knows each other how small till I started. Yeah. Until I started, I had no idea. You think you th- like from the outside, you're like, Oh my gosh, guitar media. Oh, it's this huge, massive thing. Oh, we're all flying by the seat of our pants over here. <laughs> like even <laughs> the organizations that you think are huge are like, there's really not that many people involved, you know? Yeah. And, and I don't know how much planning you think goes into this podcast, but I swear no matter what you think it is, it's less. <laughs> <laughs> you think it's zero is less than that. <laughs> it's less than that. Um, it, I feel like Steve and I actively work against us getting content done when we do our podcast. <laughs> 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 what can we do to sabotage ourselves this week? <laughs> uh, talk about the KTR. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so we're going to back up because we're, we are going to go down all kinds of rabbit holes and mm-hmm. weird trails. I already know. So let's get the intro out of the way for those that might not be aware, or maybe you've got some viewers who have never sort of heard your story. Sure. Like, how'd you, how'd you get into guitar? And how did that end up into YouTube and mm. podcasting? I think I got into guitar the same way almost every you know teenage kid in the '90s got into guitar. Uh, I actually, ha- my mom had a guitar. She had this acoustic guitar, and we lent it out to a friend. And I was watching that friend play it, and he played the intro, the the, the four power chords intro to "Smells Like Teen Spirit," which was huge. Like you think it's huge now. Like it was, you couldn't get away from it back then. Uh-uh. So I watched him play it and it's like, Oh, I could do that. It's easy. It's just like, a, it's just like a rectangle there. I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're moving a rectangle into four places. Like I can do that. And so it's like, how much that, that's how I think of it. I was like, I'm taking, <laughs> I'm taking the guitar back. We're not loaning it to you anymore. And I started learning to play guitar. And it's just one of those things where it's like, you're a teenager, you're a teenage kid, especially a teenage boy. It, you can find anything, anything to do with your hands to pass the time. That's what you got to do. <laughs> like anything. <laughs> and I think that's where a lot of guitar players come from. But anyways, uh, you know, like I very immediately from the beginning was more about the gear and thinking about the gear than actually being a good player and learning how to play and stuff like that. Like I loved learning to play. I loved learning songs. I didn't care about formal instruction. I didn't care about learning to play things right. I just wanted to like take a stab at every song that I loved. So I'd take a stab at it for a while, learn, learn some noodly riffs and then move on. Like I wasn't one of these players. that's like, Oh my gosh, I've got to be good. You know, I don't want anyone to ever hear me play bad. Like I still don't care if people hear me play bad. So fast forward from there, uh, did you want to know the source of what I'm everything I'm doing now? I don't remember. Uh, yeah, let's get there. Okay, I'll try to wrap it up as as short as I can. So, in my mid thirties, yeah, mid thirties, uh, my friend Steve and I had been spending pretty much years chatting back and forth on instant messenger while we were at our at our jobs, <laughs> you know, on the clock working. We would chat back and forth. Uh, like, Hey, check out this Craigslist ad. Hey, check out this like used ad that I found, check out this deal. And we're constantly just sending stuff back and forth to each other and chatting about it. And then we both started listening to podcasts about the same time. And we kind of realized like, we should probably be recording this. We've kind of been podcasting over text messenger for like years now. If we recorded this, some people might want to listen to it. Let's try it. So we got around to trying it. We already had all the recording gear, what we thought we needed <laughs> to start. Uh, Steve looked up a way to publish the episodes for free without hosting and stuff like that. And we just went for it. And then over time, I'd say like a year or so, uh, eventually we got on the radar 
of some pedal builders. Uh, JHS notably was the first pedal builder to send me pedals. Uh, I had a friend that was going out to visit JHS. I was like, ah, bring me back some pedals. We'll talk about them on the show. Ah. And he's like, yeah, sure, totally. And then he brought back pedals. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how that works. Yeah, he, he told he told Josh about what we were doing. And Josh was like, well, here's, you know, here's a couple blemish pedals. Take take these to them. <laughs> so I had already started doing video work, like commercial video work on the side with a buddy of mine. So I had video gear. Right. And I was, a, you know, we were all aware of YouTube demos. Like Andy from Pro Guitar Shop was the yeah. thing. We were all watching Andy all day, every single day. It was, it was ridiculous. And I was like, I'm gonna, if I'm gonna be given pedals, I've got this nagging Puritan work ethic. I can't just accept gifts. <laughs> if, if I'm gonna be given pedals, I'm gonna take a stab at doing videos. And so I did a couple videos. Uh, I don't think. They were of any value anymore as far as like demos go, but they were a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun making them. If you go back and find them at the very beginning of the channel now, you see like I'm leaning much harder into like doing pretty camera shots and stuff like that. And I have no idea how to play for the camera. Like I have no idea. I'm not even on the camera. I don't even talk, but it just, <laughs> it just grew from there that I'm betting that first video was like 2015. And so it's taken me this long to get where I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seven years. Yeah. So you have a, you have a background in graphic design though. Well, yeah. You, yeah. So, so you, you can tell because you know, your, your graphics are, are pro, uh, even though they're, they're quirky. They're definitely you like editing Ryan. Sure. Sure. Editing Ryan joke the other day, but. The, uh, the graphics that I do for all this stuff is not, is like way below what I would do for a client. <laughs> like, it's like, oh, I, I need something and I have the ability to do it. So I just like, oh, here's the thing. Like, like the, the, the business of, of what I do is so dependent on like really fast turnover of videos and stuff like that. Like, it's, I don't have time to sit and spend, you know, even a day on, on a single graphic or something like that. Like the logo, I just yeah. like crapped out the logo. <laughs> It's like, yeah. this will work, and now I'm stuck with it forever. <laughs> yeah, you are. You can't do anything. With it. I can't do anything. And I every now I think, like, oh, I could redo the logo. I'm like, I'm eight, like eight years into this podcast, like, no, no one wants like, to see can, a new logo. You can rebrand. No one's yeah, asking for it. Are rebranding. Oh, are I mean, they? Yeah, yeah, they're redoing their logos. So okay, uh, and and their music, and they they finally ended season one after like seven years. <laughs> <laughs> We're still working on episode one. Like four, 400 podcasts in and they're all one continuous episode. <laughs> oh, someone should do that. Episode someone two is going to be crazy. Someone who has way more time than me <laughs> go through and start stitching together. All the episodes is one, just one long episode. Oh my gosh. Please time lapse it. Don't, don't make it. It'd be it, it, after everything, everything. It'd be like 500 hours. Yeah, I I can't imagine how long that would be. Oh man, don't think about that stuff too hard. Like, I won't. Five hundred hours of my life podcasting, not even editing, just being on the podcast. No, you see, it's like those, it's like those, it's like those video games that keep track of how much time you've played that game. Ooh, that's Stop dangerous. Stop hollering at me. Yeah. Stop pointing out how much of my life I've wasted. You know, for for this digital dopamine burst that you guys gave me. Well, that's not too uh, bad. Twenty. Days of my life have been spent recording podcasts with Steve. That's not bad. No, that's still less than a month if yeah. you just went full tilt. You know, that's, that's not awful. That's good time spent. That's well yeah, worth it. You, you know, five five hundred hours is still only a quarter of a year working. If you look at it that way, I probably spend more time on the toilet. If I'm honest with myself. <laughs> Uh, all right, we're there now. All right, so, so I we got there quick. Yeah, we yeah. Than I expected. Well, I was um, holding back. So uh, it could oh, have been a lot yeah, quicker. Good. Yeah, I wanted to open yeah, with yeah. that. Yeah, let's let's hold up because we we need to save that kind of conversation for the uh, Patreon special. Episode. Sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> before we go that much further, um, but yeah, so you've been doing this for a while. You're mm -hmm. making videos. You're doing podcasting. You're going to Germany. Yeah. Uh, hanging out in a hot tub with a bunch of dudes. Um, <laughs> looks like a good good time. You're making I it mean, sound so sexy now. It is so glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> it's so incredible. <laughs> this, 
you see folks start a podcast and this could be the glamorous life you have. (laughs) (laughs) It is, it is wild. It is, it is really crazy. And it's like, you know, you, you, you've done it now. You've gone to summer now we stayed in the same house together. Like you've seen what that life is like and here you are still doing it. It it kind of reminds me of college. It's, yeah, it's a lot like college. <laughs> oh, it's exactly like college, and we're all working on our terrible college projects, and just like <laughs> trying to pretend it's a group project. Yeah, and then oh, it's not. There's no group projects. <laughs> no. Yeah, I was talking to someone about this the other day, like my college experience, and like trying to do group projects, and the problem is that the problem was that no teacher was ever like, okay, here you you're all assigned to a group. Now I'm assigning the leader of the group. If if the teacher had assigned a a leader, no matter who it was, they don't need to be qualified. But this is the person who is the leader who makes the final decision. It would have made every group project go so smooth. But in college, you're just like, what do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? You want to do this? Instead, uh, someone has to step up and make themselves yeah. that leader. Uh, and That's then you're a dick. Like if you name yourself the leader, you're a dick. Yeah. Like the teacher has to do it. You have to be hired to be middle management. <laughs> It's, it's like a nickname. You can't give yourself a nickname. So right. Has to give you that nickname. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You're 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 a, you're a douche if you do if you give yourself a nickname. So we were talking. I'm trying to figure out how we got here. We were talking about uh, these events where there's all these yeah. YouTubers and guitar media, and we're you know like this college group projects. That's how we got here. Yeah. That's exactly it. Right. So uh, just to. Oh, I want to. So you talked about this on one of the episodes that you did while you were over in Germany, and I, I find it an, an interesting conversation to have. And y'all were talking about the longevity of this entire thing, mm. uh, and just the whole like, can you <laughs> love? Can you retire at this? And everybody was like, I'm never retiring. I can't retire. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think about it honestly, uh, really quick on that thing. Like, I, I say retire. Like, I'd love to retire from needing to support myself someday, not having to worry about and just retire and be like, okay, I'm going to take social security. I'm not going to worry about making money. If I do make money, whatever, but I can't see myself stopping doing this sort of stuff because it's not just my work. It's also my hobby. Like it's, it's what I love doing, you know, like I'm not going to quit guitar like when I retire, I'm like, well, I'm done playing guitar because I retired and I'm not going to, I love doing all this stuff just as much as I love playing guitar. So it's like the, the quitting isn't going to happen whether or not uh, this sort of thing is commercially viable for another yeah. 25 years, you know, something <laughs> like that. That's, that's a, the question. That's a big gamble. Like think of businesses that have been around 25 years like business models that have been around 25 years on the internet. Like there's not a lot. No, there's not a whole lot at all. Yeah. Um, but think of, think of business models that have been around on the internet for 15 years. You get a bigger list, but it's still like stuff changes really quick. It does. And you got to adapt quickly. And it's, it's an interesting, um, as I meet more and more people who are doing this, uh, this is their living, either demos or podcasts or um, just making videos in general. Um, cause some people, there are people out there just who just do videos that aren't necessarily demos. Sure. Uh, you've got your, like, uh, your dines is and your Terry berries and exactly. your music's is wins and stuff like that. They're inter- they're yeah. general entertainment channels that built around guitar channels. We'll be right back. This podcast is supported in part by string joy strings. I'm a snob. At least that's what people tell me. I'm never okay with good enough, and that's where Stringjoy strings come in. They're better than good enough. They're the best. Stringjoy are making some of the finest strings available today right up the road from me in Nashville, Tennessee. They offer custom sets, balanced tension, coated strings, the works. If you need it, they can probably make it happen. You should be using Stringjoy strings, and if you're going to order from them, you really could help this podcast out by clicking the affiliate link down in the description or show notes below. You get amazing strings, I get a little bit of that back to help the show keep going. It's a win-win situation. Get your Stringjoy strings today. And that's it. And and I think that's I think that's where you'll see a lot of the the longevity or those that are entertaining outside of the demo content because you got to you got to maintain that entertaining. Yeah, it's 
infotainment, I think I heard is oh, the totally. term that I hate that term. I hate <laughs> I hate, hate spoon. It's what it is, but it's also like, uh, yeah, let's not say that. <laughs> right. <Let's> Synergy. Not... <laughs> buzzword. <laughs> when, when buzzword is a buzzword. Right, right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's so dumb. Anyway, um, it's it's fascinating. I, I find it like the whole podcasting thing. Like I mm-hmm. remember when it first came out, you know, I had like my little iPod and people talked is like that wasn't when they came out. But I remember when I first became conscious of them in like the mid 2000s, sure. like, late, late to mid 2000s. And <clears throat> there wasn't a lot out there. No, they're just there. And, and what was out there was. I guess very much like today, it's very much a crapshoot as to what, what the quality is going to be like. Yeah. You know, you never know. And back then, I dismissed it. I was like, oh, this, yeah. is, this is not going anywhere. This is dumb. And now podcasts are like becoming this big, big deal. Everybody's got a favorite podcast or everybody's got a set of podcasts they listen to every week. I know I have mine. And it seems like I won't say most because it's still not a majority market, but a large section of of population listens to podcasts on mm-hmm. an almost daily basis now. And some of them listen to podcasts that aren't on NPR. It's incredible. <laughs> I, I actually I had to stop listening to, to NPR because it started to become this uh, almost ASMR for me and putting me to sleep. So it's like it didn't matter what the topic was. Right. They always talk like this. And it was, yeah. conver- you know, a very deep conversation. I was like, you're just putting me to sleep. This is. It's like when I was in music school and I would be forced to go to a piano recital. I don't care what you're playing. I'm going to sleep through your recital. Right, it's totally. going to happen. Yeah. It's just, so, you're so yeah. relaxing. I just got to fall asleep, yeah. you know. Put me in a dark hall and make me listen to piano. And someone, <laughs> for the love of God, wake me up when it's over. Don't leave me in here. It does sound pretty nice, honestly. Like, what if, yeah, if I was, if I was stupid rich, like that level of rich, you do whatever you want. Like I would have professional musicians come and like lull me to sleep. Like I don't, I have like a harpist. Like that, that is a level of rich. Like if you're, <laughs> if you're rich and you're not doing that stuff, like you're wasting your you're money. Wa- you're wasting your money and you're, you're also wasting society's time because there's a harpist out there waiting to be hired. <laughs> that like, is spread, what we mean when we say support local music. This is what we need like the super rich to be doing is to be hiring us peasants for like <laughs> seemingly <laughs> like yeah, trivial yeah, and yeah, frivolous, um, frivolous reasons, you know, hire all of us to do frivolous, trivial things. It'll be awesome. So, yeah. I'm, lo- I'm looking to hire a classical guitar and violinist duo to come play for a dinner. Oh, is it a special event? No, it's just Tuesday. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's just Tuesday. I'm just picking up Taco Bell. <laughs> I love it. I, no, like if I was, I, this is why I'm not rich. Cause people who, who have these ideas don't become rich. If I was rich, I would like hire bands. I'd hire like mariachi bands to show up at Taco Bell and I'd film it. Yeah. See, I'll, I'll never be rich because like what will happen is I'll just get a four figure tax return and think I'm rich. I'm hiring someone to play at my dinner. <laughs> it's like, no, I, now I'm out of money. I have nothing right. Left. It's all gone. That's, that's not rich, Philip. That's, that's right. That's, that's college student thinks he's rich. When you're rich, oh. you don't pay taxes. That's oh, did we get that's, political that's, too early? <laughs> <laughs> that is true, though. I'm supposed to say uh, that for the Patreons. It's, it's very, very similar to that old uh, the thing I used to say when, when, you know, when when I was a teenager and when I was in my twenties and I couldn't afford gear, and I'd see all the, the the famous musicians with all their their endorsement deals and people giving them gear, and I'd be like, yeah. The, that time you've made it, and this is so naive, like, now that I know, like, the real life of pro musicians. Right. Like, how how not rich the majority of them are. Yeah. But the joke was always, oh, yeah, now that they can afford to buy their own instruments, people just give them to them. They don't need to buy their own thing anymore. It's like, that's not quite the way that works. And, like, you know? a weird thing to think about, and this is me, like, showing you a pink behind, peek behind the curtain of what I do. Like I get sent stuff all the time. Like I get given yeah. stuff all the time because I'm basically making commercials. Like functionally I'm making commercials. I'm, I'm promoting products and the, per, the, the company that sent it to me is hoping that people will buy it because they saw me uh, presenting the product, whether I said anything good or bad about it at all. They just want, you know, the, the su- subscribers I have to, to see their object on the screen. So I get sent stuff. 
the vast majority of endorsed artists are paying artist rate. They're not getting their stuff for free. They're still paying for it. They're basically paying a little bit above the production cost. Like they're still like I'm getting stuff sent to me and I'm getting not beyond free because I'm getting paid. (laughs) That's right. You're getting paid for it. You're You're essentially flow. I mean, right, right. You really think about it, but like, you you have that idea when you're young, like oh my gosh, uh, this 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 musician that's in this magazine is endorsed by this brand. They must have one in every color of this guitar, and they might, but the yeah. the vast majority of those situations are the artists still paying for the gear, not as not retail, not MSRP, but right. they're still paying for it. So it's it's a, it's a really weird thing for me to think about that I I'm not doing that. <laughs> like who yeah. am, who am I? Like I suck at guitar compared to even your worst professional musician. Like I I'm not a professional musician. I'm a professional video video person. Videographer. Is that what they're called? That's, That's what I am. A professional <laughs> videographer. There you go. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and you know it's it's worth looking at it that way. It, it is a commercial. Right. And, but it's a it's a commercial where you I don't know. It's, it's there's such an interesting way of looking at because you've got to build some trust because you're you've got to have you're going to have different segments of your audience. You're going to people have people who came because they they were looking for that product. Right. You're going to have people who are coming because they're um, interested in your take on a product, and then you're going to have people who are just going to watch what you do because they're entertained by you anyway. Okay, so, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop an energetic dynamic synergy callback here uh uh i need, I need a buzzword yeah what's it. what's the word we're oh, it's infotainment yes. it's infotainment uh yeah. it like it's it's really hard to define uh between there's two like varying definitions that people accuse me of doing most of them accuse me of do, being a reviewer i don't consider what i do to be reviews the, th- the thing that I pitch myself as to the companies that might want to hire me is a demo channel. I do demonstrations. The problem with both these definitions is that neither of them work because if I was purely doing demonstrations, then I'm the guy at the county fair pushing Ginsu knives and, you know, <laughs> you know, the towels that wipe everything up, you know. Uh, but if I'm doing reviews, then it's like, I'm Siskel and Ebert going and, you know, it might be a, a press release or a press, you know, version of the movie or whatever, screener is what they call them. Uh, but still, it's like I'm going, I'm watching the thing, I'm picking, you know, how many stars out of five or thumbs up or reels or whatever, and I'm doing an editorial thing for people to know my full opinion on everything. And it's like I'm doing a hybrid of those things. I don't want to call myself a reviewer because it's not this, you know, journalistic endeavor. I can't call myself the guitar player approach, basically the magazine guitar player. Right. I can't call myself a demonstrator because if there is a problem, I show it. I go, oh, hey, here's like I like Fender just sent me the uh, the player plus strat. Oh, yeah. And in the video, I'm like, oh, man, it's, it's really hard to to pull the push pull. If I was a demonstrator pushing Ginsu knives at the county fair, I'm not going to tell you what's hard to yeah. do with the product. Yeah, exactly. So really, it's I'm not either of those things. I'm an entertainer with an audience doing giving them information. You can combine those words if you want to. Information and entertainer. And because I have an audience the manufacturers and the people marketing stuff want it in my hands, no matter what I say about it. Like they just want eyes on it. Like, so it's, it's a really, it's like we need a new word for this in between space where I'm not really demonstrating, but I am, and I'm not really reviewing, but I am. It's like an independent demo reviewer. <laughs> Re, redemo, redemo. Rem, Remo? Now we're, now we're just going too far. I'm a Remo, Remo artist. A brand, yeah, yeah. You're a Remo artist. I'm a Revo artist. Remo? Oh, I don't gotcha. know. I don't know. 
Yeah, it's 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 a fascinating and and the growth of it. And I've talked about it on the podcast before because and I, um, I you know when I I played the same gear for ten years, mm-hmm. right? Playing playing, you know, I didn't play like a ton. I was doing like fifty to seventy shows a year. Um, That's plenty. Uh, that was it was a bunch. Yeah. Um, at one at, for a couple of years there, it was even more than that. I was making my living as a guitar player. Mm. Um, That's which great. Was fun. But it sucked. Yeah, it was fun. You know what I mean? It was fun playing music, um, and that was everything from wedding gigs to you know bar gigs to cover stuff to tribute bands, whatever, whatever I could play. Um, and that was fine. I remember one. I got a call to play a wedding once. Uh, I got a, a message on Facebook. Actually, someone said, "Hey, are you still free, uh, willing to play our wedding?" I said, it, "They just wanted acoustic guitar at their wedding. That's it." You know, I was like. Yeah, sure. All you got to do is let me know when, and we'll work it out. Well, it's tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, all right. Did you well, just propose? Go. Like this sounds. Right. But <laughs> most there, people plan. Story. Most people plan their wedding for at least at least three days. At least, yeah, maybe a week if you're really getting delicate, you know, <laughs> right, right. Organized about it, but no. So, but yeah, there was like there were a couple of years there where I was like. I was constantly playing, you know, two, three mm-hmm. gigs uh, a week sometimes, and um, and then blues festivals, especially there would those would be kind of crazy. There's one festival in particular I'd play like seven or eight gigs in over three days and just be madhouse. Mm. Um, and so I played the same rig, uh, even though I loved gear. I spent a ton of my time in a secondhand musical instrument store, and so I played whatever came in. But that meant I didn't know any of the new gear that was coming out. Mm. I knew the the late sixties, early seventies fenders that were coming in, or I knew, you know, lots of tube screamers. Um it, it wasn't really a pedal store to be honest. There wasn't a lot of pedals coming through, but sure. like, crazy old guitars, you know, old K's and airlines and uh Sears guitars mm. and, and it, you never knew what else was gonna come in. Like they would there would randomly be uh in fact, I think they're still in the store, like a 64 refin uh, jazz master, Ooh. you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. You, you never knew. You walked in one day and there's a, a K arch top that there's an inch and a half between the strings and the, the fretboard, you know, and like this is a wall hanger. Yeah. And then there's a 1962 Gretsch Country Gentleman on yeah. the wall or something Ooh. like that. It's such a cool store to be in. But I was never up on whatever the newest thing coming out was. Um, and I'm, I'm a guitar player, you know, barely making money. So I couldn't afford the magazines at the time. Yeah. But then, then all of a sudden, a few years ago, uh, 2017, 2018, I came across a pedal I didn't know existed, which apparently there were a few thousand of them. I didn't know. Existed. There's a couple, and there's I, a couple new yeah, pedals. And I looked around at suddenly at the landscape of, uh, the gear world and it was, what a weird, wild it's place it had become. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's insane. And so you've got to have these people out there uh, pushing it. And uh, you remember it, like it, the, the old days with the magazines. I say old days, the magazines still exist. But the old days when the magazines. Really, though? Not they, really, not really. really. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like when the magazines were all you really had, like you would th- thumb through the first like. 80% of the magazine and here's all the big name brands, all 20 of them. Yep. That's all there is. And then you get to the back and here's all the little black and white ads, like 30 of them on a page, like all the little upstarts you'd never heard of before. You never will hear of again. Cause they'll never have an ad budget ever again. And they're just trying to make yep. like, they're trying to test the waters with the magazine to see if, you know, the $2,000 fee to have a four by four square is worth it. You know? And that that back section of the magazine where all the wild stuff is, where there's brands you've never heard of before, where there's builders you've never heard of before, that's the 90% now. Yeah. That's, that's the, the that's the entire industry now. And you know, the, the big guys, the big couple big guys are still doing really, really good. They're making big money. Sure. But they record money. But as far as like the attention that the industry re- receives from the consumer as they're shopping, like they're 
they're almost an afterthought. Like people are going to buy their stuff no matter what, yep. but it's like, Oh, you know, like, you know, you know, Fender Gibson comes out with a new guitar. So, oh yeah. I want to talk about that. I want to check it out. I want to discuss it with my friends, but man, I'm looking at this small builder right now. And I'm thinking about a custom thing and stuff like that. Like that's what, where people are mentally versus when they're shopping for two and three and $4,000 guitars now versus how it was before. It's like you, you, when I was starting to learn a guitar in the nineties, like it was very rare for anyone to be like, Oh, here's this brand. You probably haven't heard of them, but man, I, I paid a bunch of money to these. And now it's almost like a badge of honor to be like, Oh yeah, I've, you know, I got this custom guitar just for me. There's none like it. You know, like I put it in custom order like two years ago, it's finally done from this builder that you, you'll never hear of again. <laughs> it's yeah. like a badge of honor to get this very, you know, niche sorts of stuff like, oh yeah you could get one without the weight if you want to but it's going to be five six thousand dollars right right or it's not you don't get to pick the color it's just what's available exactly. you know? <laughs> gotta get what's available but everyone can have a custom guitar now from a multitude of brands there's a there's a builder out there who makes guitars just the way you like them and you can find yep. that person it's wild and there's the same with pedals like pedals are even crazier because there's a thousands there's thousands tens of thousands of pedal companies and the vast majority of them are a guy or a girl a couple two friends in a garage and yep. they're just like cranking out pedals and people are buying them they have a name for themselves in some little you know niche and people are like oh yeah the this is the pedal of our community <laughs> for whatever <laughs> reason like it's crazy like uh, uh we had uh justin gash pop into the live segment on our last podcast on 60 cycle hum. And he's a newish pedal builder. Like he started building pedals this year. He's doing it full time right now. Wow. He's selling hundreds of pedals this year. What? And he just started his, his pedal company's fuzz imp. He just started this year. That's insane. Like that, that, that crazy. like it's just, I'd say it was a gold rush. But the difference between this and a gold rush is that people are actually making livings. Like, yeah, this isn't 1949 or stuff. Like people are out there starting their own companies, being their own bosses, making products that people want, not having to deal with retailers in the middle. It's, it's the wild west right now. Like it was not like this when I started playing guitar. It was not like this even 10 years ago. No, when I started playing guitar with, with like when I first became aware of pedals, I, you know, I couldn't afford boss pedals. So, mm -hmm. I didn't, and there was nowhere near me. I could go buy boss pedals. And so I didn't even get those. I had the, I there used to be a store brand called on Q. I don't know if you're familiar with on Q is mm -hmm. basically a, let me see if I can find a, it's like an, almost like an F Y E. Okay. Uh, you yeah, so you know, music, sure, books, uh, and then other random things. It's like a they Sam hear. Goody or Sam Ash or not a Sam Ash, Sam, yeah. Sam Goody. Like where they, it was like, oh, you want to buy a record? You want to buy some headphones? You want to buy a guitar? You want to buy, you know, like there's there was weird stuff in there, like yeah, novelty gifts and, and stuff. And that was the resurgence of the Dan Electro, the mini pedals mm. and the metal ones. And so like that's what I had. You know, I, I played a, I played a lot of, lot of guitar with a daddy-o like yeah. overdrive and that was it. Those daddy were good. Oh yeah. I still think those are, I think that whole series of pedals is good. Um, yeah. One day, I keep putting it off, but like the reason I keep putting it off is because I just don't have the capital right now for putting money into things I'm not going to use, but are you going to do an all food pedal board. I, I want all, no, I want all of the big box. Ones. Oh, like, that's all worth of the big metal case ones. Not, not all of them, because some of them have become collectors' stupid price oh, well, things, yeah. like the reverse delay. Yeah, and the, but no the Sitar one, Sitar Swami. Get the get get the Daddy O, get the Cool Cat chorus. You know, wasn't there a delay? Uh, yeah, the Dan Echo. Oh, the Dan Echo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like it. Yeah, there get was a, the Fab Tone, which was a terrible fuzz. <laughs> um, but it it was a thing. It existed. You know, um, some of the best fuzzes sound broken but somehow dan electro has made a few broken sounded fuzzes that aren't the best fuzzes yeah i i have i've bought a fab tone three times because it was it was at, it was at various phases of my fuzz journey right mm -hmm. and it was like the first time i got it and i knew nothing about fuzz i'm like this is a piece of shit so 
<laughs> and so I got rid of it. And then I was like, I bought it again because I, you know, I was fuzz curious again. And so I was like, bought it. I was like, maybe I just didn't know what I was doing then because a few years down the line. Nope, still sounds like trash. And then one more time, I, I got one. I think a buddy of mine was giving it away. And so I was like, fine, give it to me. And this is after I'd, I'd gotten into fuzz a little bit. I was like, nope, this thing is still trash. <laughs> and now I'm going to get hate from somebody who says, no, the fab tone's amazing. No, it's not. <laughs> you have, you have some kind some kind of trauma in your life that has made you think that that pedal sounds good. <laughs> I don't know who hurt you, but um, that pedal does not sound good in, in any way. It, it doesn't sound bad in the way that's good. Because there are some pedals that do that, that broken thing you were just talking about. Yeah. It doesn't sound good. It's just bad. I, I remember, like, you couldn't give them away for 20 25 bucks. It calls it a distortion. It, it, was it a fuzz or a distortion? It was, yes. <laughs> it, it was, I'm intrigued. So it's somewhere between, like, a big muff and a rat. Ooh. And, like... I, I don't yeah, it's an interesting one. If you've never played one, you should definitely try one out. Should um, I should I buy one on reverb right now? They're they're still super cheap. They're still yeah, they're very cheap. cheap. Yeah. Um uh if you're gonna if you get one and you decide to do a video on it, let me know so I can buy one before you do and sell it a week <laughs> oh, after come you on. put your video up. <laughs> there's there's a billion fab tones out there. I like, know, I know. People, people there's no sixty cycle hum bump. Like the, anytime something is sold out is because there's only five left on Amazon when I published the video. <laughs> I, I, you probably have a little more influence than you're giving yourself credit. I, do, I don't, there's, there's been a few times when things have sold really well after I covered them. I'll, yeah. I'll be honest and I'll say that, but there's no like across the board bump where it's like, well, what am I going to, what am I going to clear out today? You know, like I'm going to pick a, Random builder, and I'm going to bless their lives by having, well, you know, you know, a thousand sales in a day. I can remember. Um, so when I got into, when I discovered all the pedals, I started to find the pedal groups on Facebook. And I, then I found the podcast and video channels. And now I'll be honest, I'm mostly a, a podcast listener. I, I don't watch a ton of videos anymore. Oh, there you go. Live on the podcast. There we go. There we go. Bought it now. 55 so, bucks shipped. I see. <laughs> so, they're still so cheap. <laughs> oh my gosh! So I uh, hope maybe you will make it sound better than I could. But I'm gonna I'm gonna check it out. This is gonna be fun. Actually, one of my first fuzz pedal, my first real fuzz pedal that wasn't like a digital fuzz in a multi effect unit. Uh, I have to finish this later. Uh, <laughs> uh, was a Dan Electro. Uh, cool cat fuzz i think that it was like the really cheap plastic line oh yeah one of the with the really the, bad no, no. foot switches and was uh the food one it was wasn't the food, food one it was a, a line after that um okay and most of the pedals in that line are are a lot of people don't like them but the fuzz they, here's what they did the first run of those pedals uh, they they got in trouble because they did a couple uh, clones. They did a couple circuit rips of oh. current, at the time, boutique stuff. Like, they weren't ripping Tube Screamers. Like, they were ripping Temmies. And the, oh. the original orange uh, uh, fuzz, which is the one I started with, was a rip of the Peach, puzz, peach Fuzz by Frantone. Oh, yeah. Like old school OG boutiques. Yeah. Like old school. Super small well, that's when that stuff came out, which would make looking back, it makes it even more shocking that Dan Electro was ripping circuits from brands that barely existed by today's standard, yeah. like people in their garages, you know, yeah. like it was not, it's not, it's not ripping from the market. That's not ripping from JHS now. That's ripping from JHS when he was building pedals in his bedroom. Like that. Like, in Jackson, Mississippi, actually. Yeah. That's uh, crazy to think about Dan Electro doing that. But that was my that was my first fuzz pedal. And I didn't <laughs> I didn't really get it. I was like, oh, it's like a like like a weird, like boomy distortion. Like, and it sounds kind of like really, really crispy. Like I didn't get it yet. I was I wasn't listening to the music that would make me go on a more serious fuzz journey later. So that makes sense. Yeah. I, 
for me, Fuzz is like main. They uh, continued to be a mystery. I tried Big Muffs a few times, and uh, that was because I had tons of my friends who were into like they were really into either Pink Floyd or sure. they were really into Smashing Pumpkins, or right? Were, you know, and they kept telling me how great these pedals were. If you're so, into seventies music or nineties music. You're gonna, you gotta, have it. you gotta try a big muff. Like that's yeah. just what's gonna happen. The eighties get a synth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I discovered mine because like for, for me, the, the music that I, I know and love, cause I'm a, I'm a boomer trapped in an older millennial body. is like <laughs> all that, all that late, that early to late sixties into the early seventies stuff that yeah, I, yeah. I love. So give me fuzz faces, give me, Octavio, yeah. Octafuzzes, and that's what I want. That's that's the nastiness. I the want. nastier, the better. Yeah, I, and tone benders. Ooh, and, yeah. I didn't. It, it took me way too long to discover tone benders. Like same, when the same. when the boss one got announced, I was like, well, now I got to try tone benders, and so I got a couple. It's like, why have I been skipping over this? <laughs> yeah. Like of all I, the fuzzes that I've been skipping over, like this is they're honestly just. They're the perfect balance. Like you can do ripping psychedelic sixties fuzz with it, or you can dig in and it's like a distortion fuzz. Like, yep. They're amazing. Tone benders are amazing. I got into one, um, really, really recently in the last, I don't know, 12 months. Cause I bought a pedal. A guy had this pedal made by a guy custom build. It's a Klon circuit and a tone bender, uh, Mark three in the same housing. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that. Yeah. I had actually seen it on the gear page because a guy by the name of Pick Dropper, he works for prescription uh, effects, but he does his own side thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so he normally does mini pedals, but this guy, turned out, was in Mississippi, local to me, had bought one of his pedals and had him put the two pedals together in a big enclosure. And he had posted a picture of it on the gear page. And he's like, I don't know what to do with the rest of the room in this enclosure. Like the two pedals <laughs> take up like so little of the <laughs> yeah so little of the enclosure here's and so here's my thing I, like okay go ahead you finish your story i won't yeah. interrupt <laughs> yeah so I, I i bought that and the i became so enamored with that tone bender side of that circuit mm -hmm. and, and now i i have a great one uh blake over at the tone mob had did, done a partnership with solid gold effect yeah. at one point and he did a pedal and one popped up on guitar center used and so i snagged it for a song because they didn't know what it was. <laughs> yeah. It was sold super cheap. And so the, yeah, the model I, 001 is up. Yep, yeah. I've had the like gold one. I've had two of those and I had the unbranded solid gold. <laughs> I had three at the same time, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> and it made me feel super bad. But like a year ago, I was like, this is stupid. I can't have three of these. And you know they're they're different. Like the 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 tone mob one is different than the solid gold version, but I, they're 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 in the same ballpark, you know. So I sold off the solid gold one, and I'm sitting there with two of <laughs> the tone mob pedals. One's Germanium and one's uh, the regular one, and I just sat there playing them back and forth. It's like I can't keep up with both. I gotta sell one of these, and I sold the original and kept the geran the germanium. I always want to say yeah. geranium now because someone put that poison in my head because like, oh, some people accidentally pronounce it geranium. I was like, well, I've never heard that. Now I'm gonna do it all the time. It's the British, right? It's got to be the British. I'm gonna blame them. But yeah, so I'm looking yeah, to see if I can see it. I think I've got it in a drawer. I've, it's on the pedal board down here. I'm not gonna pick it up. I've, <laughs> I've tried too many times on this podcast with a video component to pick up a pedal board and it's attached to cables. And I'm like, this is yeah, stupid. Yeah. Um, uh, but you know, going back just a little bit of a point of, of influence. I, one time I distinctly remember watching the influence you had. This is weird. This okay. is a weird one. It wasn't even something you demoed like, or at least not intentionally demoed it. You were talking about your, um, your Ibanez tube screamer amp that you ah. had or had. I don't know if you still have. No, I sold that. Um, yeah. And well, after you talked about them, the price on them uh, rose by about 30%. Really? I watched. It. Yeah. I watched because I had looked at them not that long before the used you price them on one of your episodes. Yeah. The used price. Cause they were, by the time this was, they weren't a new product. Right. Anymore, right. Right. So they yeah. still sell. No, I think they still sell the combo and they're cheap. Oh, they really? Sell, yeah. They're, they're they really cheap. Still sell they're cheap. New. Like, when I bought mine, oh, I knew they were cheap. When, when I bought started. my head, 
that I had, I bought it 200 used. I think they're like 300 new or they were, I don't know what they are now, oh, wow. but they're not expensive yeah. starting out. Like even on the new market. So no, I saw it spiked for a little bit and then mm. fell back down to normal, but it's, it's interesting to watch, especially in this time period of limited availability, uh, you know, supply chain issues, uh, shipment issues, worker issues to see some of the outrageous price points that oh. junk is going for. There's People some junk try like ridiculous. I think we st see stuff listed, but very rarely is there an actual thing that actually sells like that. You know, yeah. like I had a friend who was trying to artificially inflate the the used uh, rate for the Ibanez LA metal. <laughs> <laughs> and to be fair, it looks it looks cool. It's it's like a modified rat, but he was buying up everyone that he saw because he can get them for 50, 60 bucks. And then he was trying and then he was like, I'm going to promote them all. And I'm going to be like, this is the best pedal ever. And then the price is going to double. And then I'm going to flip them. And I, 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 I don't think that ever it happened. Worked. No, yeah. I, I bought one. I bought one because I, I saw one pop up. It's like, well, I'm not going to let him have them all. I'm going to get it. And I, <laughs> I had it around for a while. And it's true. It's kind of like a modified rat, but it was never like, I'm going to use this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got a few things sitting around that I'm like, I'm not going to use this. Why do I have it? But yeah, um, you have a few things. I have a couple of things. <laughs> yeah, you've got a few. Th we won't. We don't even talk about the bins of the affordable board pedals. Oh my gosh, I got. Okay, I need to read an email to you right sure. now. Uh, <laughs> Story time with Brian. Bird. This, I got this email tonight, and it is bonkers. And I'm gonna. I'm going to do it. Uh, I have to find it because it's at the bottom of a big thread of other emails. Okay. Um, hell, this is from Azure, the uh -huh. affordable board brand that I covered before. Hello, we are the Azure team. Our company has recently done an event and a batch of reverb pedals are given away for free. You don't need to pay anything to get dozens or even hundreds of pedals, which you can give to your fans. But you you can tell me if you need it. But the pedal has a defective rate of 5 to 10%. <laughs> and the sound is a bit problematic. You can check it and give it to your fans to increase your fans. This is an email that I got tonight, like an hour before this. And I went back and forth with the guy a little bit. <laughs> And at the end, I was like, Steve talked me into it. Steve was like, do this, <laughs> do this. And I, at the end, I was like, send me as many as you want. <laughs> is what I oh, said no. to the guy. And he wrote back. <laughs> and he said, I have sent out 100 reverb pedals. And it, is, it is kind of the most threatening email I've ever read in my entire life. Like, <laughs> Someone is sending me 100 reaver pedals. And I honestly don't know what Steve is thinking, like the logistics of sending out. You realize it costs $8 to ship something through a padded envelope through the post office. That's $800 in shipping. And we have to print, and we gave them away. We have to print out a thousand labels. No, a hundred labels, not a thousand. Oh, <laughs> we have to match all those emails yeah, for people. You, yeah, but you're not going to be able to send out a hundred. They've got a, a failure rate of five to ten percent. <laughs> I think those are the going to be. No, I, here's the plan: the, the 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 failured ones. They sound problematic. That sounds interesting. <laughs> that does. That it, sounds like specifically fun. Send out the problematic. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna flip that five percent. Like. <laughs> Those are going up for charity auction. <laughs> you oh, want one that works? Lord. Eight bucks shipping. It's yours. You want a problematic one? <laughs> You're going to have to bid, buddy. <laughs> it's going to cost you. <laughs> for charity. For charity, of course. I don't want to pay taxes on that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Is like, And now, like, as if there weren't enough pedal companies already, right. now there's all of the cheap uh asian made you know sure amazon pedals they were just gonna know that's a that's actually a brand that's not even like a category anymore it's actually a brand right right of 
it the market is insane and it continues to grow and is still supporting people starting this year and doing it full time as a job. Yeah, it's 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 insane. One day it's got to all come down, right? It can't it's not sustainable forever. And my hope is that I can be there to be the media that covers it when it all crashes <laughs> down and, and not have my finances invested too heavily in, you know, in those sorts of things. Like I hope my money comes mostly from ad rates or something like that, you oh know? but it's like, it, it can't be sustainable. It can't be. No, it, it, there's too many pedals. Point, there's just too many pedals out there. Um, if the they stopped making, it, if, if going to be nothing, if everyone stopped making pedals today, not even talking about guitars. Everyone's talking about making pedals today. There's enough for a long time. Used market would skyrocket. They would become much more expensive. Uh, you know, any pedal well, would become yeah. more expensive because, you know, people, someone has to want to sell it. It's not being made. Uh, but we would have enough pedals for everyone for a long time. Yeah, for like the next three or four generations of guitarists in the world, there are plenty of pedals. There's there's plenty of stuff out there. No, that's what the to make anymore. That's what the archaeologists are going to be digging up. They're like, man, they love these things. Why are there so many? <laughs> Can you imagine somebody who specializes in 1990s guitar effects archaeology? Like that specifically. <laughs> well, what that's goes, that's easy. 90s is easy. 2000 uh, zeros. The aughts gets interesting. Well, those 2010 are, gets interesting. 2020s, how will they even keep track of it all? Like, but but those are like those are like sifting riverbeds for arrowheads and pottery. Like right. no no no. The real the real finds are those 1990s battles that you We're know. Gonna, oh man, if you can if you can dig up under like four layers of of earth and and you know stuff that's compiled over the years and still find an an in box and plastic dan electro tuna right. whatever that pedal was the thing is that uh, they at a certain point we're still talking about collectors market for usability at a certain point they're going to they're not going to be vintage they're not going to be that sort of thing they're going to be antique oh god think about all the gear that's going to be antique you go into an antique store now and it's like, mm -hmm. wow, they got a lot of toy wagons. Yeah, because they made a crap ton of toy wagons, and no one wants their kid past 1940 to play in this rust bucket. So there's a lot of wagons. I'm just making up an example. I don't know if there's a lot of wagons. Sure. But <laughs> but I, it's like I mean, you're going to – Well, look at it this way. Guitar pedals are going to litter antique stores, and people will have to explain, oh, this is what they used to do with these, and now we just use them as, like, paperweights or, like, decorations on the fireplace mantle. Like, oh, I thought this one was cute, you know? Yeah. Oh, look, this one's got a, a pink – it's pink and it has a cat on it. <laughs> it, has a pic <laughs> it has a picture that I relate to. People will buy them as little trinkets that they put on their shelves in 200 years. Like, they won't be functional as objects anymore. But as, they'll still as, exist as, because they're made out of metal. As I look at both of us, both of us with shelves with pedals on them, right? As as art, but so like we're years? we're keeping them because we're definitely going to use them for real music that we're really going to make this important that people care about. We're not just collecting objects just to collect them. That would be silly. Yeah. That'd be, that's ridiculous, <laughs> wasteful, even. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Terrible. Why would anyone do well, that? To put it into a, a, a you know a real scenario with with guitars, look at uh, I had Eric Daw from um, the Fret Files podcast on, and he was talking about all those old K and silver tone guitars that they made in the fifties and sixties, and the reason because he he talked about in order for something to skyrocket in value as it does, it's going to have to have three things: one, it's got to have quality. Mm -hmm. Two, it's got – now I'm not going to remember these. Um, Infotainment. Quality, yes. <laughs> quality, scarcity, and there's a third one I'm missing. But let's Like desirability? Scarcity. Yeah, maybe. Um, Mojo. It's got to have that magic. It, well, you look at those old silver tones in K's, and they have not really skyrocketed in price, especially the acoustics, specifically the acoustics. There's certain but, models that people will yeah. pay more for, but That's it's still like fewer of them out there. Imagine, like I say, I say this often about like Mose Rights and, and a few other brands from the '60s. Imagine buying a '65 Stratocaster right now. Imagine buying a '58 Les Paul or whatever. Um, do with Mo's right, right now. Ten, tens of thousands of dollars at the bottom end. 
you can go buy a Moserite for five grand in 1965. Yep. You can go buy a Harmony for eight hundred dollars. 1960s guitar. You can buy Maybe it for four hundred dollars if it's in good condition. You know, like that. It, and you can probably flip that pickup for one hundred seventy-five because cooter casters exist now. You know, oh, yeah, <laughs> like all that sort of stuff. And it's we we think in our minds like, oh, vintage is valuable. That stuff probably hasn't kept up with inflation. <laughs> like it's no. cheaper now than it was in the sixties. <laughs> and I have this theory about a lot of the the smaller and boutique brands, and this is going to be a little unpopular. Mm. Unless uh, you look at some of the the brands like um, Nutter Guitars. I know you sure. have Nutter Guitar. I met Brian at, at Summerland. Makes incredible guitars. Yes. Yeah. You look at someone like. Uh, Cower making yeah. incredible guitars, small builder, not a ton of them out there, uh, or even someone like I have a Novo. Look at the stuff yeah. Dennis Fano is making over at Novo. The, the thing is, though, in the long term, those guitars are not going to climb in value in the, I think, in the decades, in the way that maybe an American Pro Strat from right now sure. is going to be in. 40, 50 years. Well, we're not going to see what we're seeing now when we yeah. get to boomer age uh, because there is so much variety now and, you know, major artists aren't visually connected to specific builds and brands the way they used to. They're all like us. They're gearheads. They're like, they might try a different guitar every week. Who knows? Uh, but it's like you go back to the 60s and the 70s and it's like, which of the four models did Jimmy Page play? Which of the right. four models did Jimmy hand? All the Jimmies. You go through the Jimmies. What guitars did they play? And it's like, it's really easy to be like, well, it was a Gibson or a Fender. And it was one of two or three models. And so that collectability of those original instruments is there. Is that even going to exist for bands from the 90s? You know, like, well, you know, because the 90s, it's funny you pick the 90s. The 90s was that first, I, I feel like it was the first decade that started to look back and find those vintage right. instruments. Right. The 80s didn't give a shit about vintage no, instruments. It was over. Um, So it was the 90s that first started going back and finding those 60s strats, those 60s and, and 50s Les Pauls and those kinds of things. The collector's market them. really picked up speed. Yeah. And they were buying them for a song. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were buying them for nothing. Oh, compared to what we pay now, like, but I remember like being on forums in like '99 and people being like, "Oh, I can't believe how much '60s jazz masters are now. It's all Kurt Cobain's fault." And blah 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 blah. Right. And they were probably complaining because they were nine hundred dollars. <laughs> right. I can I can remember complaining about the Klon when it was six hundred dollars. Right. Right. <laughs> it's like, but like the uh, the things that are going to be collectible. And, and the Klon's a good example. The things that are going to be collectible when, you know, 25 years, let's say 25 years from now. Um, I'm, I've got that number in my head because that's when I'll be 65. <laughs> 25 years same, from now, same. I've got that retirement money and I'm buying up collectibles from my youth to try to remember, you know, fragments of the golden years of my life or something like that. And it's like, oh, I want to get, you know, whatever gu guitar uh chris cornell played oh yeah i can buy you know mid yeah whatever mid 90s less pauls for you know whatever less balls go for now it's not going to be the equivalent of like oh jimmy page is selling one of his guitars we're going to drop the the bidding starts at half a million like <laughs> yeah um, it's the it's not but but even it's that's not, not a good comparison because I'm comparing his actual guitar to the model. Like, like you go back and you look at, you know, whatever year of Les Paul Jimmy Page was playing, you want to buy that same year. And it's going to be way, way more expensive proportionally to what you would pay for that same sort of scenario from a 90s guitar, from a 2000s guitar. You know, like imagine 25, 35 years from now, like, oh, I want the same guitar that was played in Jimmy Eat World. <laughs> You're gonna be able to find it. <laughs> it's gonna be. Yeah, it's gonna be there. It's gonna I, be there. <laughs> I'm curious, man. I can't wait to look back. I in like, uh, hopefully, I'll be there to see it. But in like 2059, when like 
the 1959 Les Paul's a hundred years old. They won't be, and, they'll be, it'll cross the line into antiques. They won't be playable anymore. Like no one will yeah. be like, Oh yeah, I'm still gigging with this. No. But, but think how much one that was still playable would go for. Well, here's the thing. The people who drive up the value on that, and this is how things transition from vintage to antique. The uh-huh. people who are the generation that care enough to pay half a million, to pay full millions, gone. they'll be gone. And the, the nostalgia of the, the remaining generations, the following generations, won't have first-person nostalgia. Like, oh, I re- they're not going to be like, oh, I remember when I first, when the first time I heard, you know, Immigrant Song on the radio, <laughs> like, yeah. because it just got released and it got blown up on radio for months straight. Like, they're, there's not, uh, like, they're not going to be like, oh, man, I remember when I went and saw Jimmy play at Woodstock. Those people will be gone. So you have secondhand nostalgia. That's not as profitable. There's not as much money on secondhand nostalgia. You know, point. like if you were going to sell, you know, Cary Grant's robe right now, it would functionally go for less than if you had sold it when Cary Grant fans were still alive. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, it make it makes, it makes logical sense. I just wonder if the continued, because we are talking about something that will degrade so much and there'll be fewer and fewer available that mm-hmm. are in good shape. I wonder if that scarcity will drive those few that remain to still be at least similarly valuable. I think we'll just see stuff move into museums and it'll, if there are, you know, bidding wars over them and it'll be the playground of the hyper wealthy and not the playground of people who want to play a guitar, you know? Yep. All, all the, it'll be all those folks living in, in the central city, not us living in the districts. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I like that. (laughs) So, uh, Anyway, right, what what future gonna... what future are you betting on? You're betting on a Mad Max future, a Judge Dredd future, a Jetsons future. What do you think is going to happen? Um, I don't see why we can't have them all. I think they all. <laughs> it's a big world. It's a real big world out there. I like that optimism. <laughs> is that optimism? We can have it all. I, I don't know. It'd be like I, I feel like there's a possibility that like. The Jetsons future is also the Mad Max future because, like, all the Jetsons just live above the fray. Well, you know, that's a theory, right? You know, there's a theory that the Jetsons and the Flintstones exist in the same timeline and the Jetsons are just the ground level. I mean, the the Flintstones. Don't they have shared characters? They do. The Flintstones live on on the Earth, which is a wasteland populated by mutant creatures that resemble dinosaurs. And the Jetsons live above it all in the clouds and they have no idea what's down there. (laughs) <laughs> that's it's like it's like the wookies on because <laughs> right they don't know what's down there yeah um huh I, i'm sad that i know that i've been playing way too much knights of the old republic um so, i didn't get the reference but i rolled with it i was like yeah yeah uh, totally yeah. No, wookies star no, wookies yeah star oh, star yeah. war right yeah star war uh, the, the Dark the Vader's Wars? my favorite. Actually, I do enjoy Star Wars. I, I yeah. tease at it, but I do enjoy it. So uh, I think I think that's a good stopping point. We've been talking for a minute. I want to save a little. Oh, I thought we were still in the stuff. intro. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot to say, hey, guys, make sure you can go share the podcast with a friend. That's a way you can support the show for free. Uh, leave a rate and review. Uh, like and subscribe on uh, YouTube. Thumbs up. Uh, you can thumbs down if you really feel it. I mean, it, it YouTube reads it the same way. Um, they don't, you know, leave a comment for the algorithm, all those things. Um, smash that like button. I feel, I feel dirty. Devastate I that like button. I don't, you know, if that like button can walk away, you didn't do it right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> needs to be a little hitch and it's giddy up as it's getting out. Of you. Um, <laughs> oh, I like the way you said that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but you know, if if you do want to go over to Patreon, uh, as we're about to go over to the Patreon episode of the podcast mm. for this week, uh, uh, you go to patreon.com slash 40 watt podcast, um, have multiple levels from three to $50 a month at $50 a month. We'll get together and we will, uh, I'll do lessons, guitar, bass, piano, uh, music theory, whatever you want, or we'll just shoot the shit for, for an hour. It doesn't a $50 matter. lessons, um, a good deal. 
Yeah. It, I see. I think so. Plus, you get the extra episode as well. Yeah. Some swag, and um, I do give twenty five percent of my proceeds from Patreon to charity every year. So nice. this year's charity is St. Jude Children's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. So I'm going to give 25% of all the money brought in in 2021 to St. Jude in December or January, somewhere thereabout. And uh, I will publish how much that is uh, at that time. And I'll pick a new charity for next year. So in, in the meantime. You should get people to Ryan, vote for the charity. That's a good idea. Like that's a good campaign. Um, yeah. So I'm going to push for that a little later. I, I think I'm going to, when I get closer to starting, to have to actually pick a new one. I'm going to I'm going to put a thing out on Instagram and and Facebook and get people to give me ideas for charities that they they feel like should be supported. Here's what you do. Uh, every every time someone joins Patreon, they get to vote. Oh, I like that. And then it's like you're only you're only taking votes from people who are invested. That's a good way to do it. And you All you right. pick you pick 3. You don't let them just suggest willy-nilly. You pick 3. And yeah. you let them pick, and then they and then they feel really invested in it, you know. All right. Uh, well, few, Patreon supporters and future Patreon supporters. Uh, so if you join the Patreon, it might be a poll popping up here in the next month or so, where you can start uh, deciding what charity I give to next year. There you um, go. Uh, when you join, actually, actually, watch me steal join, this idea. It's a good idea. <laughs> no, it's a good one. When you join Patreon, make sure you send me a message on Patreon and. Tell me your favorite charity, and I will use those to find the three that get voted on. Nice. So there we go. So that's the way that's going to roll. Um, for Ryan from 60 Cycle Hum, you can find all of his links down below. I should have mentioned that earlier. You know how to find me. Come on, everyone. Yeah. If they want to uh, find me, they'll find me. <laughs> that's true. And if they don't want to find you, they'll still find you to complain about your <laughs> <laughs> exactly. and, uh, in the meantime i'm philip y'all be sure to be good to yourselves be kind to each other and try to make some noise mm. This episode is brought to you by the supporters of 40 Watt Podcast over on Patreon. Go over to patreon.com slash 40 Watt Podcast, where for as little as $3 per month, you can help support the podcast and get every episode ad-free. For $5 a month, you'll get every episode ad-free as well as a bonus episode every week. I can't overstate how thankful I am for the support of my patrons and hope you'll consider joining the team and helping keep this show on the road.